What you've been watching is, in fact, uh, some of the uh, operation that occurred to move a, an eight-ton base uh, together with an 800-pound statue and how that all worked. And the mastermind is Rod Drake, so uh, he deserves all the attention he can get. And if you get his autograph, you're a lucky person. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is a big day for the Robert Jackson Center. This is a big day for all of the friends of the J Jackson Center, for this is a rededication of the Robert H. Jackson statue. And I just couldn't be more pleased to have this opportunity to have this in front of all of you. We have a tremendous amount of dignitaries who have joined us today and ones that I'll be recognizing throughout the program. But as you can see, we have a statue. We have a statue which uh, we're thrilled was put there in, on May 24th, 2016, and I'll give a brief history in just a moment. In order to get the activities going, I'm going to call up Father Moritz Fuchs. But before I do call up Father Moritz Fuchs to provide an invocation, for those that may not know who he is, he is uh, an ordained priest. He's the Catholic priest from Fulton, New York. He's been over the, such well over 50 years. But most importantly, here's a picture. Here's a picture which hangs right over there. This is a picture taken by Ray D'Addario one of the photographers of the Nuremberg trial. Ray was here in 2002 and gave us uh, an explanation of the pictures that he took and actually described them. In this picture is Justice Robert H. Jackson, our guy. Also in this picture, sitting right over here in military garb and still looking, at, looking as fit as he does now, is one Private Moritz Fuchs. Private Moritz Fuchs then became Sergeant Moritz Fuchs, and he was the bodyguard for Robert H. Jackson 24-7. There was one. Think about our officials today, the kind of security that's usually attached to them, but in this case, there was one. So nobody, nobody, Knew Robert Jackson more at his time during Nuremberg. I can tell you there's nobody surviving who knows him even anywhere close. And we're so thrilled to have at this special rededication ceremony that they are chaplain in residence at the Robert Jackson Center, the one who's done uh, invocations and benedictions. We've had Chief Justice Rehnquist, Chief Justice Roberts, and other names, uh, small names that we don't mention. <laughs> so, without any further ado, please give a warm welcome to Father Moore. We're gathered here to honor the memory of a great man, Robert H. Jackson, noted and respected for his genuine sincerity and ability in advancing the rule of law internationally. Almighty God, creator of our world, our universe and unknown more universes beyond, we admire and adore you for creating our blue and white planet, which is seen as such for the first time by our own generation. Yet in your infinite ever loving care, you grace some, set some humans apart in leadership abilities. In this context, we continue to ask you strong support on our efforts to continue and to extend the spirit that leads us to so honor United States Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson. From the decorations and inscriptions adorning the United States Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C., Justice Jackson acknowledged the Ten Commandments as the base of the wall, just law, the rule of law. May the rededication, relocation of this statue inspire many others, adults and young people too, to similarly cherish our heritage of freedom and integrity, 
Help us, God, to value honesty and commitment to live in such ways that promote justice and responsibility on which freedom and peace depend. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Fuchs. We have so many notables in the uh, audience tonight that if I started down the list, I would be em terribly embarrassed. Uh, however, there are a few I do want to call out. And uh, we have two special people from Buffalo today. The honorary council for the, the German consulate in Buffalo. Currently, Matthew Collard. Matt, if you want to just stand up and be recognized. Matt. Up there. And his predecessor, Chris Koble. Chris, also here, thank you very much. Our county executive and the leader and the guidance and who's been involved all intimately with the Jackson Center for so, so many years, Vince Horrigan. Vince? Uh, there will be a couple of dignitaries who will speak a little bit later, so I'm going to bypass them. So Andy and Jackie, I will get to you, okay, just so you know that. And I do want to call out uh, one specific person who really helped us immeasurably in making possible the statue move. Uh, and that is Jamestown Public School Superintendent Tim Maines. And Tim, we couldn't have, definitely could not have done it without you. And Tim, if we recognize you. Tim, thank you very much. In your packet today, was also uh, a notice, and a notice of a play that's occurring tomorrow at the Reg Linnae Civic Center, very topical, called Judgment at Nuremberg, and it's being put on by the LA Theater Works, and we're honored and thrilled to have in our attendance tonight the actors who are part of that. So if you could stand, rise, and we'd like to recognize you. We had a chance to uh, interview most of them yesterday after giving them a tour, and wow, are they class acts. So I highly recommend that uh, you join all of them tomorrow. It's at 2 o'clock at the Reg Linnae Civic Center. Um, he'll be called out quite a bit, but I, I do want to just call out today uh, Dexter Benedict. Dexter Benedict is from Penyan, New York. Dexter Benedict is the sculptor. Dexter Benedict is the guy responsible for that, or we wouldn't have a dedication, let alone a rededication. So, uh, and we're just thrilled that you and your wife could join us. There will be another ceremony shortly thereafter with you and, and, and Don and Christine. Thank you very much. Uh, but Dexter, I want you to stand just to, so they know who you are. Let me go through the history of the statue. This was fascinating to me. Uh, I must tell you, I thought I knew it, and I did not. So let me go through the background of it for, for history's sake, because the question is, whose idea was it to in commission Dexter Benedict? How did that happen? What was the thought processes that got there? And until the Gebby Foundation and their executive director, uh, Greg Edwards, thank you for sharing, um, gave me the file, I had no clue. This is fascinating. And back in 1992, 92, uh, the dean, assistant dean at Jamestown Community College, Ted Smith, had an idea of having a Robert H. Jackson lecture. And they would like to have that lectureship on an annual basis, and he'd like to have, have it endowed. And so he approached the Gebby Foundation, headed by John Hamilton, uh, Greg's predecessor, with the idea of endowing it. 
Well, I must tell you, not every grant request to Gabby Foundation is accepted. Uh, but, but this one planted a seed. And the seed worked its way through to the fact that John Hamilton and a group was formed to honor Robert Jackson in some form or fashion. So a committee was formed, and several, and some of the members are here tonight, to commission uh, an open, op open opportunity to submit an RFP for what they would think would be the best for Robert Jackson. This juried selection of an appropriate Robert H. Jackson piece um, was, by the way, for those who remember, that was designed to be something right at the Jamestown S.G. Love School, Jamestown Public Schools, after they demolished the Five Points development. So that was part and parcel of the reason it was going to be something there. Long story short, they had this juried selection. Dexter might give us more detail as to what the process was. But appropriately, Dexter's uh, submission was in fact accepted. He then worked on it. It was then delivered to the city of Jamestown. And the next thing you know, on August 14th, 1996, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor came to Jamestown and dedicated the statue. I was one of those kids. Okay, kid, listen to me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, don't I wish. Uh, folks in there with my camcorder, my ever-ready camcorder, taking movies of Justice O'Connor, talking about a Jamestown lawyer, a Jamestown Supreme Court justice, and, and in attendance were the two children of Robert Jackson, Bill Jackson and Mary Jackson. And I'm pleased to also introduce uh, the grandchildren of Robert Jackson who've joined us, Tom Loftus right over there. Thank you very much, Tom. And Julia Craigill. So, Julia, please welcome Julia. So, I had a chance to meet the siblings of Robert Jackson, and I'm thrilled that the Jackson Center has the grandchildren on our board here at the Jackson Center. But as a result, Justice O'Connor dedicated it was on C-SPAN. It got an awful lot of attention, not only nationally but locally as well, where conversations started to occur as to whether there was something in addition that could be done to memorialize Robert Jackson. And part and parcel of that uh, found fruition in the form of a Robert Jackson Center here in 2001, uh, working closely with, and there are many of our friends from the Mace Masonic Order, Scottish Rite Consistory. We purchased this building. We've had a chance to uh, enhance the building over this time period, and so it becomes very much part of a community process and a community treasure. And so here we are uh, 20 years after the actual dedication. Today, through the, the, the good encouragement of the Jamestown Public Schools, the various foundations, and a tremendous amount of people who are in the audience who assisted us financially, uh, directly and, and, and indirectly, uh, to make it happen so that we today can be so thrilled to have a, the Robert Jackson statue here. And we're equally honored, we're equally honored to have as our keynote speaker from, who's the attorney for the general consulate out of New York City. And this, she's a big deal. She's a big deal. So I'm so thrilled to have the head of the legal and counsel for the German consulate, uh, general, German consulate general in New York City, Tanya Beyer, who uh, on behalf of the German government uh, will have some words to say. So, Tanya, please join us. Thank you. Um, dear Jackson family members, dear Father Fuchs, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Consul General Britta Wagner unfortunately couldn't come here personally tonight, so she asked me to stand in for her and to convey her best wishes to the uh, Jackson family to the Jackson Center and to everyone gathered here tonight. It is a great honor for me to speak here tonight in front of you 
on the occasion of the statute unveiling, that is one statute dedication, one statute rededication, on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, that is to be more specific, the 70th anniversary of the principal first judgment in 1946 in Nuremberg, and at the same time, the 15th anniversary of the Robert H. Jackson Center here in Jamestown. So thank you very much for having me. I would like to talk a bit about the meaning that the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg had for Germany as well as for the uh, world community. Um, of course, I am not an expert as much as John is. We will hear more specific details and more uh, in-depth details about that later in your lecture. Um, so I would just like to give you a general overview really of you know, the general meaning of that International Military Tribunal. The formal acceptance of the Allies in World War II of Nazi Germany's unconditional surrender on May 8, 1945, marks a milestone in, Germany, in German history, of course. Using the words of Germany's former President Richard von Weizsäcker in his famous speech on May 8, 1985, that is on the um, 40th anniversary of the end of World War II, the uh, victory of the Allies is understood to be, quote, the day that liberated all of us from the inhumanity and tyranny of the National Socialist regime. In other words, not only did the end of World War II free the countries formerly occupied by Nazi Germany, Germany but also the German nation itself from the atrocities of the Nazi regime. The uh, subsequent International Military Tribunal that started in Nuremberg in 1945 played an essential role in the much needed pursuit of justice after World War II and the subsequent rehabilitation of Germany. The United States chief prosecutor of the trial, Robert H. Jackson, became renowned not only for helping Germany identify those responsible for the war crimes committed by the Nazi regime in the dark years until 1945, but also for starting to reintroduce justice back into Germany. Robert H. Jackson was right when he stated in his opening speech at the trial in 1945 that, quote, the wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. Jackson also emphasized in his opening statement that the Nuremberg trial was aimed at bringing the individual actors of the Nazi regime to justice rather than at blaming the German nation as a collective. The 24 defendants included many Nazi party officials as well as high-ranking military officers. They were charged with crimes against peace and humanity. However, Justice Jackson also made it clear that the trials were not only trials against Germans, but also trials in the name of humanity. The trial was the first display of Nazi crimes in public and stands as the historical starting point to analyze and overcome the crimes and thus come to terms with the past. It is of course regrettable that the Nuremberg trial focused solely on war crimes committed by the Nazis in the occupied countries, not crimes against humanity carried out in Germany itself, most notably the killing of Jews and others in the concentration camps on German soil. It also needs to be kept in mind that not all Nazis were held responsible for their crimes after the war, and many of them continued in important political and judicial roles when the Federal Republic of Germany was founded in 1994, 1949. However, or 
so to speak, therefore, trials concerning Nazi crimes are still being conducted in Germany up until today. Although the legal justification of the Nuremberg trial was controversial at the time, most notably the re retroactiveness of the newly invented definitions of war crimes, which had not been in place when those war crimes were committed, was controversial at the time, it constitutes a historically important precedent for international criminal law dealing with crimes against humanity all over the world. Following the Nuremberg trial, the Nuremberg principles were established in 1950 by the International Law Commission of the United Nations. Based on Robert H. Jackson's groundbreaking work, these important guidelines stipulate the definition of war crimes and the Nuremberg trial became the model for the International Criminal Court in The Hague, founded in 2002. For the purpose of promoting international criminal justice and human rights in Robert H. Jackson's spirit, the International Nuremberg Principles Academy was established in Nuremberg, Bavaria, last year. This academy pursues to support the worldwide enforcement of international criminal law and to enhance the knowledge as well as raise awareness in this field of law all over the world. Germany is most grateful to Robert H. Jackson for reminding the world community that awareness of essential events in the past is necessary to prevent new tragedies from happening in the future. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Jackson Center has been thrilled to have a, an ongoing relationship with Germany. Uh, we've had uh, been there several times as their guests, most recently on the 70th anniversary of the Nuremberg trial, and John Barrett presented at the Palace of Justice, as did many others. We've gone previously with Father Fuchs uh, as uh, touring some of the old haunts of Father Fuchs aspect of it. And so we're thrilled to have that current and we look forward to a greater relationship between the Robert Jackson Center and working with uh, not only the government itself but the Nuremberg Academy among others. I, I'm, before I call up Father Fuchs for the benediction, I'd like to call up uh, Jackie Phelps. Jackie who is representing here Congressman Thomas Reed. Jackie? Thank you. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be here tonight to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the Jackson Center and the rededication of the statue. Mr. Benedict, I am not an artist in any sense of the word, but I'll tell you, one thing that I think I share with the whole community is an appreciation for the work that you do. So thank you so much. Father Fuchs, Thank you for your service to our country, our community, and the world. You're an incredible man, and we're lucky to have you with us today. And Tanya, um, I went through a bit of a slew of emotions when I was sitting down. I was a junior in high school when Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist came to the Jackson Center. And um, since I had been a little girl, I had wanted to practice law and go to law school and so when the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was going to speak, our teacher at the time did us an invaluable favor and taught us a lesson that you go and you learn from the best. And I was able to see the Chief Justice speak and oh my goodness, was it incredible. And in my second or third year of working for the Congressman, it happened again when Chief Justice, Re or Chief Justice Roberts came. So. Um, I guess my point in that is this center makes such an impact on not only our community, from the students that it teaches, to the adults that it teaches, but to the world. 
Professor Barrett, I get your, your emails quite frequently, and I read them, and I learn so much. So thank you for continuing to teach me. Another reason why I think that this is so important, and Tanya, the slew of emotions came into your talks, is because when I was in college, I went to a Jesuit school, Canisius, up in Buffalo, and we had service learning trips. And I hadn't chosen to go on a few different ones, but then the opportunity to spend a summer in Poland volunteering at an orphanage came up. And my grandpa, a World War II veteran, was Polish. And it was working with children in an orphanage. And I said, okay, God, I hear you. I'm supposed to go on one of these service trips. And I went. And while we were there, after we, we spent time with the orphanage, we went to Auschwitz and Birkenau. And we saw firsthand how inhumane the Nazi concentration camps were. But I think it's very important about what you said with the, Nuremberg served such an important person or purpose. It liberated the world. And it made sure that we held those accountable for their actions, but it also taught us a lesson that that will never happen again. And this center, the Jackson Center, teaches us so much, and it teaches us that as well, with the things that we do, and the speakers, and the events, and all of Greg's fabulous interviews. And so, I guess I'm, I'm here on behalf of Congressman Reed. I usually start with that. <laughs> um, who is the congressman for the 23rd Congressional District, which is the best district in the country. It includes not only Jamestown, but Penn Yan, where Mr. Benedict is from. Um, so I'm here to present on behalf of the congressman a certificate of special congressional recognition, a congressional proclamation, to say thank you for 15 years. Thank you for your dedication and your service to community. God bless you, and let's have a whole lot more because this, this country and this community and this world have a lot left to learn. So thank you. Thanks, Jackie. That was terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. Now I'd like to call up a, a dear friend and our assemblyman uh, from the assembly, uh, Andy Goodell. You'll be pleased to know I have just three points to make. <laughs> but I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget. Um, this is really a, a, a very unique occasion when we're here in Jamestown recognizing and honoring one of our own. Grew up in Frewsburg, moved to Jamestown, and then impacted the world. And that's really an extraordinary thing. But what also struck me is that when Justice Jackson was alive, he never forgot his roots. Now many of you know when he lived in Jamestown, he was four doors down from where my father and my aunts and uncles grew up in the Goodell home. But what you might not realize is that whenever the Goodell kids, when I say kids, they'd all be in their hundreds now. <laughs> but whenever the Goodell boys or my aunts were in Washington, D.C., they stayed with the Jacksons. Now think about that. A local guy who's on the U.S. Supreme Court opening his house the guests from here, as many of us would as well. And when Justice Jackson passed away, his funeral wasn't in Washington, D.C. It was here in Jamestown at St. Luke's. And out, I think out in the lobby is a picture from the funeral. And uh, one of the pallbearers was my father. So even though he was making international law and affecting the world, he remembered where he came from. 
then of course Justice Jackson participated in the Supreme Court and has numerous remarkable decisions that are remarkable not only in their understanding of the law, but their expression of common sense. And what a breath of fresh air it is when someone from this area can bring common sense to the Supreme Court. And of course, he is most known for the Nuremberg trials. And the whole concept of having a trial after a war is a remarkable concept. I mean, think about that. Hundreds, and th hundreds of thousands, millions of people died during World War II. There wasn't a lot of charity in people's feelings toward the Nazi regime. And you can understand that. If your brother or sister or cousin or your neighbor was killed fighting that regime, probably the last thing on your mind was to say, let's have a trial. Let's have defense attorneys. Let's present evidence. Let's base it on the rule of law. And so the whole concept of having a trial after such a horrific time in our history was a remarkable concept. And it took great courage and great strength from not only Justice Jackson, but from our national leaders to stand up and say, we're a country of laws and we're going to treat our worst enemies in the same way they deserve to be treated because we believe in the role and the power and the importance of law. And I will share with you I am very, very, very uncomfortable sometimes today when it seems that some of our national leaders have forgotten that lesson. Because it's so easy to send up a drone and send down a missile and kill somebody without any trial. Or to engage in similar activity. And in my opinion, that is inconsistent with what Justice Jackson stood for. Now you'll be glad to know I'm on to the third point. <laughs> there are a lot of famous people in the world. And there are a lot of people that make a difference in the history of humanity that are never remembered, whose memories and contributions slowly fade into oblivion. And so when Greg and a number of other local people got together and began the effort to form the Jackson Center, it was extraordinarily important because it made the statement that this individual who came from here, who made a difference in the world, will be remembered. And the statute that we're rededicating is important because this statute is designed to last forever, right? <laughs> this statute that we're rededicating is designed to last forever and to be a constant reminder to all of us and others that the great work of an individual who grew up here and went on to affect the course of history should always be remembered. And in honor of this occasion, it is my pleasure to bring on behalf of all my colleagues around the state a citation on behalf of the New York State 
Assembly, recognizing the Robert H. Jackson Center for 15 years of promoting the principles of justice and the rule of law as embodied in the achievements and contributions of Robert H. Jackson. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and again, I'm going to call up uh, Father Fuchs. And as he's coming up, a few housekeeping matters. One is that there is a reception to follow, so you can meet and greet several of the speakers and get an autograph from Dexter Benedict. Uh, it's not that much today. He's feeling good. Uh, and to please stay around. There's a wonderful reception. We're going over into the Grant Room area, the area where President Grant had lunch, and so you can join them, join President Grant as part of that uh, continuing. And then shortly thereafter, we'll be back up here, and we have a special presentation or two, and a surprise. So uh, please don't go away. Please pause, relax, say hello to our friendly actors, who uh, also, these are, these, by the way, they have resumes a mile long, so if you recognize them from a television show or otherwise, uh, you say, gee, didn't I see you on Seinfeld? Didn't I see you on other things? You'll say, yes, you were. So they'll be here as well. In conclusion, and we will conclude with Father Fuchs's benediction, I just want to thank everybody. This statue, the statue rededication, is a result of a whole lot of people's, a whole lot of folks' uh, belief in the Robert Jackson Center. We've now been at this for 15 years, and we have every intention to be around for a long period of time. And we have, can't help but pause and thank oh, many of you. And we have our chairman of the board here, uh, Doug Neckers, and several board members. And I just want to make sure that you thank them for what the time they do. Susan Murphy, Marion Beckerink, Allie Russell, Jen Champ, a whole lot of staff people who spend an incredible amount of time and energy on behalf of you and our Robert Jackson Center, which has, we'd like to think is, has made a difference and will continue to make a difference. And thank you, Jackie, and thank you, Andy, for your really wonderful words. And Tanya, from coming here from New York City tonight and speaking on behalf of uh, the country of Germany, that just made this incredibly special. So we're thrilled to be able to rededicate the Robert Jackson statue with the affirmation from Dexter Benedict that it's here for a long period of time. So with that, Father Fuchs, come up forward. At the ending of World War II in Europe, by the Allied defeat of the Nazis, the comprehensive historical response Robert H. Jackson at the International Military Tribunal showed the horrors inflicted by the Nazis on millions of people. Today, as we renew our appreciation of the work of this great man, Justice Jackson, we ask your blessing, Almighty God, on us and the whole human race for whom Robert Jackson was determined to show all the world the well-reasoned repudiation of all such evil and injustice. We ask you, merciful God, as we cherish the memory of this great man, Justice Jackson, to guide us in our own perilous, dangerous time as we strive to live worthily of a heritage of freedom and justice. And in a way, patterned after Chief Justice Rehnquist, I'm going to ask you for this purpose to unite. If you'd stand, please, Alva. It was a very pleasant surprise when Chief Justice Rehnquist was caught up in this very happily. And using the words that the Lord taught his apostles, asking from our heavenly creator, God, Father for all, all that we need, we ask God. So please join hands with those in nearby and pray together God's blessing on the whole world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you. Amen. While we're standing, we therefore stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>